Hey guys, let's look at the proceedings down in Florida that was the penalty phase deciding whether the death penalty would be handed out for the Parkland killer. It was a disaster, just a train wreck, and it was made worse by the behavior of the attorneys involved. Some of that, things I really haven't seen in court before and just disgusting behavior. So we'll look at that a little bit and talk about what, what in the world is going on with the death penalty uh, situation in the United States. I mean, w w what is happening here? It doesn't make sense to anybody. And specifically, I'll show you the jury verdict form that they actually use in Florida. So you can see the decisions the jurors had to make and how they ended up on an off-ramp saying, we're gonna give this guy life instead of death. Now that's a choice the jury has to make. I'm not uh, quibbling with that or arguing against that. That's the system we have. I'll just show you how it happened. But we'll talk about the process a little bit and just how bad it is. If there's one thing I think people who are for the death penalty and people who are against the death penalty can agree on, the process we're using, it just sucks. It's no good. It doesn't work for anybody. They spent six months in Florida spending, I don't know how much money, but the money's beside the point, but six months deciding the penalty for this guy who had confessed and pled guilty to mass murder. Now, you ought to be able to figure out whether you're going to put him in prison for life or whether you're going to give him the death penalty in a lot less time than that. I mean, well, how can it take six months to figure that out? There are only so many aggravating factors, only so many mitigating factors to be reviewed. It's just absolutely excessive. Now, part of that is, you know, how the judge conducts the case. And part of it is the fact that the death penalty is involved and these things get to be dragged out a lot. And that's understandable because of the nature of the penalty. But six months is ridiculous. So if you're against the death penalty and you say that's terrible, I agree. And if you're for the death penalty and you say that's terrible, I also agree. It's just an absolutely awful process. You're talking about six months, maybe four months of testimony and two months of process, six months that everybody has involved in it has to pay full attention to this situation. I mean, imagine being the family of um, one of the victims and having to have a process this long just for the sentencing phase. It's crazy. It's it's not good. I mean, it, it really is the death penalty worth it if this is the way they're gonna we're gonna handle it, especially with all the off ramps that are available. At, at the end of the day, it's gonna be rarely uh, in place and put against somebody. And I'll talk about a little flaw in that too when we get to the jury section. It's, having a jury decide uh, guilt or innocence based on facts is one thing, right? Having them decide the penalty, death or life, it's to some degree, more of a feelings thing, right? The facts are already established. The person did or didn't do whatever they were supposed to do, and then you decide whether they're mitigated or whatever. But then you kind of ask, well, what are your feelings on this? Like, how, how do you want to deal with this? That's, that's a lot to ask for people off the street, I think, versus judging witness credibility. That's just an opinion. But let's look at a little bit, just a tiny taste of what went on in this lengthy um, circus that was going on down there and how, just how bad it is. So... Let's talk about the defense counsel for a minute. You know, they've got a few important jobs there, jobs that have to be done and that I fully respect because defense counsel is the check on the power of the state. And you or I could sit there and look at this guy and know he did it, he deserves anything that's coming to him. And I certainly agree with that. But we don't always know that's the case. And so you, you have this system in place with law enforcement judges and things like that, the power of the state going against somebody, you have a defense counsel who's a check on that. And sometimes they do dirty tricks and sometimes they're not always on the up and up. That's not the point of what a defense counsel is there for. It's there to put the state to the test of its burden of proof. And so many, many defense lawyers are completely honorable people. It's not always an easy job what they have, but it's as critical a job as anything else involved in the justice system if we're to have due process. So this isn't a slam on what they do for a living at all, but it is a slam on how these people chose to do it and maybe what it says about their character. So think about what the defense counsel is there to do in this sentencing phase. The prosecution has the burden of establishing beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of aggravating factors that could support the death penalty. So defense counsel is there to see that they meet that burden of proof, point out holes in what they're saying, evidence that goes contrary to what the state is saying, show the jury why, that, why the prosecution is not correct in their analysis of the aggravating factors. And if the prosecution is able to overcome those arguments, then the jury can find in their favor. But there certainly should be someone there testing them, right? That's an admirable thing the defense counsel must do. The second is defense counsel can bring forth their own mitigating factors. 
and it could say, well, whatever you may think about the aggravating factors, look at these other factors that would be important for you to consider when you're putting uh, your judgment on the sentence of my client, whether he is killed or whether he goes to jail for life. Think about this. And there are certain things society has said, yeah, these are things we should consider. Defense counsel doesn't create those. Those are in a statute. It's the defense counsel's job to bring those up where applicable and say, look at this. Here's the evidence for this. Admirable. It's also the defense counsel's job to argue the case to the jury that here's why my client deserves perhaps to go to prison for life and not get the death penalty. Make an argument because the prosecution's going to make an argument for why there should be a death penalty. The person deserves someone to speak for them to say why they, sh they shouldn't. And then you put it in the hands of a jury who has been able to hear both sides. I don't have a problem with any of that, do you? Again, if he's guilty, he gets what he gets. But I'm talking process here and how to have the fairest, best system that we can create. And I think those are all important aspects of that. You know what's not important, though? It's making a mockery of the whole process, uh, increasing the pain of the victim's families in a situation where your client has already pled guilty. That's not a critical part of the process, is it? Uh, I'm going to show you a clip here while I'm talking of a defense counsel actually make an obscene gesture at the judge during court, straight at the judge. And I've, I have never seen anything like this. Even the mass killer who's sitting next to her looks at her and starts laughing a little bit, I think caught to some degree off guard. And what does she do? She makes a little face back to him of how hilarious this is to mock the court and to make an obscene gesture straight at the judge. If that's not a big deal to you, I don't know, maybe you've never been in court or, or you just... Just didn't have the experience I did when I came uh, into the law practice that the judge deserved respect for position, if not as a person, but hopefully both. The whole system deserved that. The jury system deserves that. The community deserves for the court system to be treated with a level of respect by all the professionals involved. And to make an obscene gesture at a judge like that and then laugh about it with a mass killer next to you, that's about as far from decorum and courtesy and politeness and professionalism as I personally have seen in a courtroom. Not that people haven't done things worse, like make fake evidence and things like that. I'm just talking about a demonstration of contempt for the judge herself, maybe as a person, uh, obviously openly in her position. I mean, not, not only have I been in a lot of courtrooms where I cannot imagine either side ever behaving that way. I was in the Army before. Do you think I would have made that kind of gesture to my commanding officer? and they would have thought that was okay and nothing would have happened? Absolutely not. It's inexcusable. I was flabbergasted that the judge has let this go, although I have seen one of the victim's families post a story saying the Florida bar is looking into it, and as well they should. It's just something needs to happen there, in my opinion, to address that behavior. How does it do anything but minimize confidence in the integrity and the seriousness of the court process? It's absolutely unnecessary and unrelated to defending their client. And I will say this about that. When you go to court for somebody, ideally, here's a couple things you don't want to do. You don't want to make the jury angry, right? If there's a jury, you don't want to make them angry. And during the process, you don't want to make the judge angry. And I know you're going to say, well, some will say, oh, well, the judge has to follow the rules. The judge is also a human being. And if you're going to do the best you can for your client, why would you want to taunt the person who decides what evidence comes in, what evidence doesn't come in. Somebody who the jury looks up to from the jury box over to the judge, they know that's who's in control. Why would you want any kind of body language or antagonism developing even subconsciously between you and the judge who has a great deal of influence over the jury? That's, that's bad lawyering. It's bad lawyering. Now, it worked out okay for them in this case because they got a juror to come down on their side that he shouldn't get the death penalty. Obviously, I don't think uh, making obscene gestures at a judge was part of a strategy to make that happen. I think that's just uh, immature, Im unprofessional behavior and really disgusting, in my opinion, just absolutely disgusting. And it was kind of a tone, I think, in some of the way the defense conducted themselves. I'll play a little clip here of the judge reacting to what she perceived to be slights throughout the course of the hearing. I just want to say this is the most uncalled for, unprofessional way to try a case. You, you
you all knew about this, and even if you didn't make your decision till this morning, to have 22 people plus all of this staff and every attorney march into court, be waiting as if it's some kind of game, now I have to send them home. The state's not ready. They're not going to have a witness ready. We have another day wasted. I, I just, I honestly, I have never experienced a level of unprofessionalism in my career. It, it's unbelievable. So, Judge, you at, if we had any pretrial matters, you asked us to be here at 9.15. We were here at 9.15 to discuss pretrial matters. I have been practicing in this county for 20 years. Uh, you know what? Years. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear well, it. Judge, you're insulting me on the record in front of my client, and I believe that I should be able to do Okay, you can do that later. You can put, make your record later. But you've been insulting me the entire trial. So, blatantly, taking your headphones off, arguing with me, um, storming out, coming late intentionally if you don't like my rulings. So, quite frankly, this has been long overdue. So please be seated. So I didn't watch all the hearing, but there was some behavior that I saw that I would think the judge is accurately describing there. Things that I think are like, I can't believe this person's doing this and they're not being held in contempt. None of those things by themselves to me as drastic or as right up front as making an obscene gesture directly at the presiding judge, uh, but still, things that go beyond what your behavior should be in a courtroom. That's my opinion on that, and obviously it was the judge's opinion. I don't, it doesn't appear that she's done anything about it. I think in her case where she said this is a long time coming, which is a, a kind of a scolding in public of that attorney, I respect this judge, but I don't. is that really the right way to handle it, though, that you let it build up until it's a long time coming and then you kind of let loose a volley? It seems like you address these things as they occur, and if they become quite serious, uh, you do, as you may have seen on some of these other televised cases, you call the, the attorneys up there and you let them know, do this again, and this is the consequence that happens. So I, I've never seen, personally, attorneys be able to, unable to conform their behavior to what the court needs, right? It can happen. I'm sure it can happen. But this judge wasn't being ridiculous in this case. The judge wasn't uh, behaving off the beam toward these attorneys. This was attorney conduct. Didn't like any of it at all. Now, again, I think this judge is a good person and is a compassionate person and wanted to run the hearing in the right way. And I can't you know, say that I would have done it better. But people have also commented over the last couple of days that, wait, what, what happened here? Because she apparently got off the bench, went down into the courtroom and was hugging people. Now, part of it was she was hugging family members, victim, family members of the victims. That, I think, demonstrates her heart, her compassion, and... Uh, it's a tough, tough case. There's, there's no way to get rid of the pain these people have. There's no way to get rid of the loss that they've experienced to bring the lives back that were, that were taken so wrongfully. And for her to demonstrate any kind of compassion after the proceedings were over to these families, I, I, can't, I can't argue with that. I think, I think it's a very decent thing for her to do. Hugging the prosecution team, though, yeah, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that if they initiate it. You shouldn't do that if you initiate it, and they should have stopped that as well, because you just shouldn't do that. You can express appreciation to the judge and things like that, but actually hugging each other after a case is over, um, I, I, I think that looks bad, maybe, for the, the next people that come up in front of her and stuff like that. I mean, the judge should look impartial. Yes, they're a human being, but I think hugging one side or the other, or maybe even hugging both sides, you just shouldn't do that. It's maybe a little different to show that level of compassion to the victims, although most judges, I think, wouldn't go that far. But again, I think she really was sincere in what she was trying to do. But hugging one side of the case, come on, people. You know, that, you know that's not good. You know that's not a good look for the system. If these people practice around each other, they're going to see each other at events anyway. They're going to see her back in her chambers if they want to after the, the case is over. You could talk about what a tough case it was then. I don't know. Well, I do know and that, in my opinion, that wasn't the time and the place for that. It just kind of capped off the everybody hates this process situation. So again, with disgusting behavior by defense attorneys, this super long, half a year long process um, and how it ended, I think everybody, no matter where you fall in the death penalty debate, can say, yeah, this isn't how to do it. So I don't know if there's an exactly right way to have a death penalty, but it sure looks like we're figuring out how to have a wrong way to do it, right? So the main thing I want to get to here is the application of the death penalty itself and just show you, because I get curious myself about these things, like how did the jury get to where they got to? What, was the, what were they asked to decide? 
and how did they get on this off-ramp? So let's take a look at Florida's jury verdict form for the death penalty. There's certain things the jurors have to do, and they can off-ramp at any kind of moment there, and when you off-ramp, it's going to be life, it's not going to be death. The first thing they have to do is find the aggravating factors. We already mentioned that, and I discussed kind of typical aggravating factors in the last video I did on the death penalty in Indiana. The jury unanimously find that the state has established beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of aggravating factor, and it's yes or no. And in this case, the state put on several aggravating factors. They have to do at least one, but they did several, and the jurors found unanimously, yes, these aggravating factors exist you know, adders to just how horrible this was, if anything could make it worse. They found the existence of these things, all of them unanimously. And I think they returned that pretty much on all the aggravating factors that were alleged. So then they're instructed, if and when they're back there in the jury room, if you answer yes to at least one of the aggravating factors listed, please proceed to section B. If it's no, don't go to section B because it's not going to be a death sentence, right? So that's the first off-ramp. B, Sufficiency of the aggravating factors as to count whatever. They did it for the various counts where it could be applicable. Reviewing the aggravating factors that we unanimously found to be established beyond a reasonable doubt, up in section A, we the jury unanim unanimously find the aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant a possible sentence of death. The jury in this case said yes to this. Reviewing the aggravating factors that we unanimously found to be established beyond a reasonable doubt, we the jury unanimously find that the aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant a possible sentence of death. They said, yep, we found these aggravating factors beyond a reasonable doubt, and we believe that they could warrant a death penalty. Okay, so they were all together on that. If you answer yes to section B, you're going to head on to section C. If it's no, you're on an off-ramp because it's life sentence, so there'll be no death penalty. So that's the second off-ramp. Mitigating circumstances. One or more individual jurors find that one or more mitigating circumstances was established by the greater weight of the evidence. So look how everything shifts here. To find an aggravating factor, you have to have 12 jurors in Florida unanimously say, we find that this aggravating factor was established beyond a reasonable doubt. But to find a mitigating factor, you only have to have one out of the 12 say, by the greater weight of the evidence. In other words, more likely than not, this mitigating factor exists. So that's a much lower intellectual burden to find the existence of a mitigating factor than it is for an aggravating factor, and much less of a judgment burden because it only takes one of the 12 to do it. One or more individual jurors find that one or more mitigating circumstances was established by the greater weight of the evidence. Yes. Now, you're going to go to Section D, regardless of your findings in C. Eligibility for the death penalty. We, the jury, unanimously find that the aggravating factors that were proven beyond a reasonable doubt outweigh the mitigating circumstances established in Section C, yes or no, and this is where they said no. They did not find that they were outweighed. We, the jury, unanimously find that the aggravating factors that were presented that were proven beyond a reasonable doubt outweigh the mitigating circumstances established? No. Not unanimously. So one or more jurors thought, you know, there are these aggravating factors. They could support a death penalty, but there's the existence of a mitigating factor, or one or more, that I think, looking at these things, I don't see the aggravating outweighing the mitigating, or I think the mitigating outweighs the aggravating. It just takes one person to do that. And that happened. So that's where the final off-ramp was used, or the actual off-ramp used to get to the life sentence instead of the death penalty, because they also have another question. E, jury verdict as the death penalty, because they could have found, having unanimously found that at least one aggravating factor has been established beyond a reasonable doubt, the aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant a sentence of death, those two things were yes, that the aggravating factors outweighed mitigating circumstances, they didn't find that, we, the jury, unanimously find the defendant should be sentenced to death. And they can still say no there, right? They can say no there, but they didn't get there in this case. If your vote to impose death is less than unanimous, the trial court will impose a sentence of life without possibility of parole. So even if they do come back with death, the judge could overturn it if she had wanted to. I don't think that would have happened. But So you see there are a lot of off-ramps there to get to a life sentence versus death penalty, and the differences in establishing one versus the other are quite different. It's a death penalty, so it needs to be serious. 
So I, I don't know that I have much to say about this form in terms of arguing with it, even as a death penalty proponent, because it is something you need to be careful with on the process side. Um, I, I think it is quite a different thing, though, to ask a jury to set in a case and decide whether X occurred. We've listened to everybody, we've looked at the evidence, and we think this person shot this person. That's one type of intellectual exercise. It's another type of intellectual exercise to say, I think this person should get the death penalty or not. Because then you're, you're, you're wandering into feelings there, right? So really, should that be unanimous? Should one person out of 12 be able to stop the death penalty? If you're against the death penalty, certainly you're going to say, of course, that should happen. And if you're pro-death penalty, you're thinking, maybe not. If, if all 12 of you could find that this person did this heinous crime, all 12 of you find the existence of aggravating factors, all 12 of you find that those could support a death penalty, maybe it shouldn't need all 12 to say, yeah, that outweighs mitigating factors because you're in a weighing function then. You're, you're no longer in a, establishing a guilt kind of a thing. That's something to think about. But again, that's how they got there. That's what their findings were. So when they, when they read the jury verdict and went back and pulled the form up to see how this worked for them, this is how it works for them. Uh, again, I think this probably makes everybody on either side of the debate of the, debate of the death penalty unhappy. No one's going to get happy anytime soon. When you have this kind of emotional weighing function, it's even less consistent than, than just your normal trial. And consistency has been an argument against the death penalty for a while. Like, shouldn't it be applied fairly? If person A kills, murders somebody in cold blood and gets the death penalty, and person B does the exact same thing and gets life imprisonment, that doesn't sound fair, does it, right? Like, they both should be tried and found guilty if the evidence is the same, you should get the same result. So if this person gets the death penalty, this person get, should get it too. If this person gets life, this should, person should get life. I'm talking about if the same crimes. But you have a less chance of that when you're asking people to use their feelings on whether this situation warrants death or not. So that, that's just a flaw in it, I think, and how it works and causes more problems with, with what is already a very contentious issue. So he's going to go to jail for the rest of his life, and this sordid episode is over. Maybe the bar will do something about some of the behavior in it. I think the public's temporarily outraged about uh, the death penalty not being applied here. I can see from the comments a lot of them don't know how the law works, which means they may not be able to be very persuasive on how to change it, particularly with all the restrictions the Supreme Court has put on it. I don't really think it's going to get any better anytime soon. Like I said, in the Indiana case, they just let themselves run out of drugs and didn't reformulate. So now they have a death penalty, but they don't actually use it. And that kind of probably tamps the issue down for them some instead of Florida, where it looked like this guy could get this penalty, but the jury didn't agree with that. And now the victims were very unhappy with that. They felt that his life was put over the lives of their loved ones. I completely understand that feeling. I don't, not too sympathetic to the juror held out, but I can see how the system, as it's established, puts that into play. Whether it's warranted in any case or not, it, it really puts a lot of subjectiveness into the decision-making process. And that's always gonna lead to problems with people. And it, is, that, is being subjective really a due process angle? It just seems like this whole thing doesn't work right or well or to the satisfaction of anybody involved on either side. And I don't think it's gonna change. Thanks, bye.